Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's text is Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Please be seated. By now, I am sure everybody knows that I feel the Bible is about Jesus from cover to cover. I, though, am not the only Lutheran pastor that feels this way. In fact, I'm sure you've had more than one pastor give that message. And so it comes as no surprise when we read a passage like what we have in our Genesis text today that we understand that in terms of Jesus. And this doesn't, uh, even, doesn't want to take into account what certain modern scholars have said, that this text is really not about Jesus, uh, that it's about other things like, oh, I have a book in there. It's a silly book written by a guy with uh, PhDs and all that kind of stuff about how this explains why people are afraid of snakes, <laughs> you know, uh, and so forth. But these scholars are out there, and you may have heard one of your former pastors even rail a little bit about them and say, these guys just don't know what they're talking about. Some of these people are so um, full of themselves that they will say that it is arrogant of humanity, arrogant of us, to think that God would deign to communicate with us like this. Well, in reality, it's humility to put yourself under the word of God and to say, I will accept God's word over my own wisdom. And indeed, uh, the ones who are arrogant are those who say, I'm smarter than God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they made a mistake. I know more than those apostles. They were reading their own opinions into God's word, but really, listen to me, because I'm just that sharp. I'm that smart. I know better than the apostles. So, long story short, I agree with all those sermons you heard before from all of your former pastors that said that this was about Jesus. They were right, and that's all there is to it. But today, we're not really going to be talking about that so much, about how this is, is uh, talking about Jesus' victory over Satan on the cross. Yes, it does mean that Jesus is going to have his heel bruised, that is, suffer tremendously while he suffers and dies for us. And it does mean that the head of Satan, that is the power of Satan, is crushed by Jesus' bloody or strange victory on the cross. But we're going to look at this a little bit differently today. Uh, we are going to look at a broader aspect of the curse. We're going to look at things like thorns and death and so forth. And because we're so centered on Christ's victory on the cross, which is a good thing, sometimes we forget that the victory is more or broader than simply opening the doors for he heaven to us. And I don't want to say opening the doors to heaven is a small thing. That's the biggest thing. That's the pinnacle of it. But we also have here thorns and thistles and you know, pain and childbearing and all of this stuff that comes along with the curse. And God gives this curse, and basically what God is telling the people of Adam and Eve and us, he's telling us that sin has consequences. And these are the natural consequences of a sinful, corrupt world. We have all of these problems. And it's not the first time that God had mentioned this. He told Adam and Eve before the fall that disobeying him was going to bring death into the world. I mean, that's, that's like... The, the big part of the curse, death, right? You know, and then everything else kind of gets assumed underneath it. For example, if I was to say, I'm going to drive my car home, that includes the wheels in the car, the steering wheel in the car, the motor in the car, 
and all of that other stuff, right? So we have death, that's the big thing, and everything else that is death-related, the thorns, the thistles, the pain, the heartache, the broken families, and so forth. So Satan uh, tempts Adam and Eve, and, you know, we know the serpent is the Satan, so you might be surprised to find out that that identification really isn't given to us until Revelation, but uh, in Revelation we find out that the serpent is Satan, and he tempts Adam and Eve. In our gospel lesson, Jesus is baptized, and then the Spirit leads him out into the wilderness to be tempted. So we have an echo here going on, you might say. And the temptation of Jesus is what we might call the official beginning of Jesus' ministry. Yes, Satan was Jesus' enemies, enemy uh, from conception on. But if you look at Mark's gospel, for example, he has none of those birth narratives, none of those wonderful stories, none of those stories about Jesus going to the temple when he's 12 years old and so forth, because that was all kind of pre-ministry stuff. Mark starts with the temptation because that is the official beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. And that official beginning of the public ministry of Jesus begins with Jesus being tempted. Just like Adam and Eve were tempted to doubt God's word, so Jesus is tempted to doubt God's word. And I need to stop here for a minute, real quick. I want a quick show of hands. How many people have been tempted at least once in their life? Anybody? Okay. Adam and Eve fall for being tempted, but Jesus doesn't. Jesus is tempted. Think about that for a minute. Does that mean being, uh, that means being tempted is not sinning? If simply being tempted was sin, then Jesus would have sinned. But Jesus never sinned. Therefore, even though everybody raised their hand when you said, I have been tempted in my life, that was not an admission of guilt. We all get tempted. Adam and Eve, when they were still perfect, were tempted. Jesus, who was perfect, was tempted. We sin when we give in to that temptation. Adam and Eve gave in to that temptation and sinned and brought a curse into the world. A curse not just on them, but on the whole world, on their offspring, and they opened the door of temptation for all of us. So Jesus faces that temptation, and just like Eve was tempted to doubt the word of God. That's where Satan always likes to start. He likes to start with doubt the word of God. So Satan says to Eve, did God really say? And she had to ponder and then begins to doubt. Well, maybe, maybe God wasn't right. Maybe this is a good-looking tree, and it was a good-looking tree. And maybe this is a good-looking fruit, and it was a good-looking fruit. And then Satan says, you know, this is going to make you wise. And so she bites. Huh? And <laughs> sin comes into the world. So let's return back to Jesus now. He goes out there. He has just been baptized, just before our reading in the gospel lesson. And the voice of God comes, the voice of the Father, and he says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son. And the first two temptations that Matthew records, Satan says, if you are the son of God, the exact same approach you would use. Doubt the word of God. I might say it's the same approach used by these so-called modern scholars. Let's not believe the Bible. Let's Believe our own wisdom. Doubt. How often are we encouraged today to doubt the word of God? Does God really say that anger is the same thing as murder? Yes. 
Does God really say that if I lust after somebody of the opposite sex, or today I could say the same sex, right? Is that the same thing as adultery? Oh, I don't think so. Does God really say that following my own will is the same thing as idolatry? Is the same thing as bowing down to a hunk of rock and praying to it? How could that be? Does God really say that we should gather together and worship in a church worship service? No. Isn't it just as good to think about God while I'm out on the links or out in the woods? Does God really say that gossip, talking about people behind their backs, is a sin? How could that be? Just listen to the news. Doubt the word of God. That's where Satan comes in. It is so easy to doubt. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He overcomes by that word. Adam and Eve abandoned the word, but Christ lives by it. Now in our text from the Old Testament, we see that God speaks of thorns and thistles and so forth. And he is not saying, why don't you stop being a gardener? Because it's just going to be a lot of hard work. That's not the main point. Thorns and thistles and so forth are used symbolically throughout the Bible to represent sin, to represent temptation, to represent trials. In fact, Paul once you know, says, I had this thorn in the flesh. And scholars have been debating what he meant by that all the time, long time. But what he meant that is obvious is he's got this persistent problem, this persistent effort to detract him from his mission. Moses, talking to the children of Israel, says that the Canaanites, because they have not been eliminated, they are going to become a thorn in their side. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that they're going to turn into little sticker bushes and start jumping out at them and sticking them in the side. That means they're going to be a persistent problem, a persistent temptation to draw them away. So that you can see, for example, Jezebel, who was uh, a descendant of Canaanites, bring Baal worship in. That's exactly what he's talking about. She was the thorn, a thorn. Okay. So these thorns are something which we see over and over again. Jesus wears a crown of thorns bearing for us the punishment for our sins. Adam is told that he will uh, eat bread by the sweat of his brow. I don't know about you, but for me, my mind instantly runs to Jesus in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, where Luke tells us sweat came from his brow like giant drops of blood. Adam labored for the bread that perishes. It doesn't last. Jesus labors and gives us the bread of life that by the sweat of his brow. And it's not a big leap of thinking to go from that bread to the bread that we will be receiving today in the Lord's Supper, where we receive his body and blood for the forgiveness of sin. Christ is going to return to the ground. Adam, return to the ground, right? From dust you are made, and, uh, and from dust you will return, right? Jesus returns to the ground. He is buried in a rich man's grave, a hole in the ground, because he bears the curse for us, the whole curse, not just part of it, but all of it. When Adam and Eve have sinned and they hear God walking in the garden, what do they do? They get embarrassed. They make a outfit out of leaves, fig leaves apparently. Not exactly what I'd call durable clothing. I notice that everybody here has kind of abandoned that sort of an outfit for something that can handle the weather a little bit better, right? So Adam and Eve cover themselves 
with something that really doesn't do a whole lot of covering. Doesn't really cover their sin. Doesn't really cover their problem. Christ, though, covers us with the robes of righteousness. He replaces our shoddy efforts with his completed and perfect effort so that we are adorned like the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. We shine with the forgiveness, the grace, the love, the righteousness of God. Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden. Christ welcomes us back in so that when Adam fell and brought sin, Christ comes and reverses that whole thing. Christ is our new Adam. This is the whole contrast that Paul is building in our lesson today out of Romans, where Adam brings sin, but Christ brings righteousness. The one act of Adam multiplied over a lot of people, but the one act of Christ covers everybody. It covers the whole person. Now, we can't go through everything uh, about how Jesus carries the curse of this, that, or the other thing, uh, but he does. But he experiences everything, but he does, does it in, uh, in kind. So, for example, uh, Jesus never gets married. Does that mean that our marriages are not redeemed because Jesus does not get married? But what is marriage about? We tend to think marriage is about family, right? Jesus lived in a family. He grew up in a family. And so Jesus redeems all of those things that are family-related, which would be marriage too. Jesus doesn't become an old man, right? He dies, what, 33, give or take a year or two, depending on which calendar you want to look at. So you might say, oh, Jesus doesn't redeem old age. If I don't die by the time I'm, say, 35, then I'm out of luck. No. What's the big thing about being old? You're that much closer to the grave, right? Anybody here feel that uh, once you cross, say, 60 or 70, uh, you're further away from the grave than you were when you were 10 or 20? Well, at 10 or 20, you still think you're immortal. You still think you're going to live forever, right? But when you're 50, 60, 70, you know you're going to die. That's the big thing about old age. And Jesus faced death for us, didn't he? So even though he doesn't face every specific thing, he faces all that we face in kind, uh, in category, if you will. So... Uh, we see, like in Romans 5.18, we read, let me turn my page. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. So Christ overcomes that curse, that general curse for us. sum it all up real quick then. Jesus bore the full curse for us and he beat it. He beat it for you and he beat it for me so that we can have life eternal. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.